All right, so we've got one more term that I really want to touch on just real quick. Um, you, you see it in your book. Obviously, it's also here on the slide. Uh, and that's proxy. And I don't know that you'll, you may not ever see that term again after today, but that's just another term for agent, really. Um, it's an agent authorized to act for a client. It's just another term. You may see something. They, I guess they could use that on the exam. Um, not sure to be honest with you, but my guess is this may be the last time you'll see it, but I just wanted to address it. It's just another term for agent. That's all they're really talking about there. All right. Now, <clears throat> what we want to, well, need to back up a little bit. We were, we were talking about in the previous hour, we were talking about commission and how commission works. And, and they'll, you'll probably get a couple, two, three questions on how to determine commission. Now, when I say how to determine it, the math part of it, obviously we said in the first hour that <clears throat> commissions are negotiable. So whatever the principal and the agent agree to, primarily the listing agent and the seller, whatever they agree to, that's what it'll be. But you'll probably get some math questions kind of like and so i just thought we would look at a two or three practice questions here just to give you an idea but here's the first question the listing agent agreed to a six percent commission and sold the house for two hundred thirty five thousand dollars so how much did the company make you know, that's about as easy as it gets right there you just take the sales price two hundred thirty five thousand times whatever the commission rate is, in this case, 6%, and you should get $14,100. Yeah, about as easy as it gets right there, pretty basic. But let's look at another question. We'll go add to it a little bit. It said the listing agent agreed to a 6% commission and sold the house for 235000 the listing agent is offering 3% to the cooperating agent. You know, the cooperating agent, and this is, you know, you need to know this. <clears throat> I don't, we didn't address this term in the first hour. But, you know, the cooperating agent is always the buyer's agent. In fact, the buyer's agent could have a few different names. Sometimes you hear the buyer's agent referred to as just buyer agent. Could be the cooperating agent. Again, cooperating agent is always the buyer's agent. But another term, just to throw it out there, is the selling agent. That confuses people. Because I know, and probably you might be thinking, well, no, the selling agent should be the listing agent, the agent working with the seller. Well, it's not. The selling agent, we're not talking about seller's agent, we're talking about selling agent. That's the buyer's agent. Because if you think about it, the listing agent listed the house for sale. But the buyer's agent, you know, whoever brings the buyer, that's the agent that actually sold the house. So the buyer's agent is the selling agent. But the term they're using in this question is the cooperating agent. <clears throat> so it says the listing agent is offering 3% to the cooperating agent buyer's agent. The cooperating agent has agreed to pay the licensee an 80% split. So you remember in the first hour, we're talking about you and your broker in charge will have to agree on what your split will be, how we're going to split the commission. So in this question, it indicates they agree to an 80% split or 80-20, meaning the licensee keeps 80%, the company will keep the other 20%. So the question is, how much did the cooperating company make and how much did the licensee make? Again, the cooperating company, that's the buyer's company, the buyer's agent, and then the licensee working with that buyer, how much did they make? So got to do figure out how much both parties made. <clears throat> well, we already know 3% of the 235000 is seven thousand fifty dollars right <coughs> excuse me so that's the total commission paid to the company 
but then 80% of that's going back to the licensee. So then you take the 7,050 times 80%, so that would be 5640 that the licensee gets. And then obviously the company in this example would be keeping 1410, the other 20%, right? So you gotta figure out what the total commission is and then how are you gonna split between the company and the licensee? Now here's another question, and I'm just kind of throwing this in here right now because they they like to ask stuff like this. Um, even though it's, it's not tied, it's not exactly a commission question, but it kind of is. But here's the question: it says the seller nets two hundred and forty thousand dollars after paying a commission of six percent and closing costs of $4,000. So how much did the property sell for? <clears throat> That's really a math question, more so than just a commission question. But I throw it in here just to kind of give you something to think about. I will tell you, in I think it's chapter um, nine, I think it's chapter nine when we get to it, is the math chapter. Um, so we'll be doing a lot of different kind of math stuff in that chapter. This is just something I just throw out there. <clears throat> so basically what this question is saying is the seller paid a 6% commission to the listing agent. He also agreed to pay $4,000 in closing costs for the buyer. So after paying the commission and closing cost, he actually received, you know, he netted $240,000. Obviously, that's not how much it actually sold for. That 240 is what he actually got a check for. The question is how much did it actually sell for? And you know, again, it's just really a basic math question. But you'll notice right here, there's, a, there's like a formula. The part over the whole times the rate. You know, it's kind of like a formula that you might be able to use in, depending on the questions they ask. Um, and you just fill, you know, if you got a formula or if you know the formula and you just fill in the blanks, you know, any, you know, the theory is if you know at least two of those items, you can figure out the third, but if they, if you know the part and you know the whole, then you just take the part divided by the whole and that would give you the rate. Or if they give you the part and they give you the rate, then you take the part divided by the rate that would give you the whole. Or if they give you the whole and the part, you multiply the whole times the rate, rather. I hope, I hope that's what I said. Whole times the rate would give you the part. Y'all, that's kind of how that formula works. <clears throat> but if you, so if we try to plug in these um, into this formula, we know they netted 240. Well, is that 240,000, is that the whole sales price? Or is that part? of the sales price. You know, obviously that's part because we're trying to figure out what the whole was. But in addition to that 240, there was another, that $4,000 in closing cost. You need to add that back to it. Okay. So when you add that back, that'd be 244,000 for the part. Now the rate, we know that 244,000 represents 94% of the total sales price because 6% was paid in commission. Now, I'm going to tell you where a lot of agents, where you get, a lot of you will get in a mess here is you'll plug 6% in for the rate <clears throat> and you're not going to get the right answer, obviously. Um, so we know the rate is a hump. It starts with a hundred percent. Well, if they had to pay 6%, you take, subtract that from a hundred, that leaves you with 94%. So the rate would be 94%. So 244,000 divided by 94%, and you can see the answer there on the slide, is 259,574.46. That was the, the whole sales price, <clears throat> right? Now again, not gonna spend any more time doing math right now. For that, we got a whole chapter dealing with math, so we'll be doing some more of that later. Just giving you a little bit of practice right up front. 
So let's move on. <clears throat> and now we need to talk about these relationships, uh, the concepts behind these relationships. And again, we're talking about re relationships, talking about between the principal and the agent. But if they become a client, y'all, they sign that written agreement. Again, that creates the agency relationship, which we now know is a fiduciary relationship. And when you enter into this relationship, two things primarily um, need to be realized here. Um, you know, one, this relationship is built on trust and confidence. That might be good to remember as well. Fiduciary relationships are built on trust and confidence. You know, you got to understand... Um, you know, there's a lot of money at stake typically when you're dealing with a real estate transaction. Um, typically hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars. Okay. So when that buyer or seller agrees to hire you as their agent, you know, their representative, you know, obviously they're putting an awful lot of trust and confidence that you're going to make them the most money, y'all you know, make, get the best deal, right? And y'all, you know, is it possible, y'all, you know, when this thing's all said and done, it didn't work out well. They didn't get the, or that for whatever reason, that your client does not feel like they got a good deal. They don't feel like you did a good job representing them at all. Um, and if they can show that because of something you did or didn't do that you should have done, um, they lost money as a result of it <clears throat> or if they can show just just incompetence you did not know what you were doing uh first of all you know, if you don't know what you're doing you better stop y'all don't try to to go through the, with this transaction and get into something that you have no experience with doing um you know, again there's just way too much money at stake now, look, you can get your broker in charge involved. That's why they're there. Um, bring them in. Tell them what's going on. Yo, especially when you're new, nobody expects you to know what to do when you're new. All right? That's, that's insanity. And you're not going to know everything you need to know by completing this course and passing the state exam. You're not. Um, Yo, we're teaching you some things that the state just want to make sure you know from a legal standpoint. But when it comes to actually practicing, representing, you, know, you need to rely on your broker in charge a lot. Um, Y'all, again, that's what they're there for. Use them. Don't try to get some, do something by yourself and get yourself in trouble. Because I'm telling you, you can and you will get sued. Y'all, I'm telling you, this is not a game here. There's a lot of money at stake. Don't mess this up. Y'all, the next thing is you see where it's talking about the company and sub-agents. <clears throat> Taught this, we talked about this a little bit in the first hour, but um, you know, you can't be out there practicing by yourself, right? You will have to hang your license with a company. Um, you and a company will have to figure that out, who it's going to be before you get your license because you know, the state will not print your license without knowing the company or broker in charge you decide to hang it with because that company will be printed on your license. So they can't print the license until we know that. So one of the things you might want to be doing along and along is maybe just set up some interview. Y'all set up some time to go talk to some brokers in charge. Um, so if you can get a good idea of what company once you get through this, the exam, what company are you going to go with? Now, again, you don't have to do that right now. You got time, uh, but it's something you could be doing. I would. I'd like to know what company I'm going with. <clears throat> All right. Um, but you have to be licensed under a broker in charge. The company will have to hire you as a sub agent to the company, right? Now, when they hire you, they can do it in one of two ways. They can hire you as an employee or an independent contractor. They can do it either way. But guess which one you're almost guaranteed going to be? 
Um, there are some rare situations where this would not be the case, but 99% of the time you will be an independent contractor. Okay. Um, you know, if you're not sure what the difference is, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit in a later chapter as well. But for now, just want you, you to understand before you get out there and start practicing, you will have to be hired, hang your license with a company and they have to bring you on either as an employee or an independent contractor. One of the two. All right. <clears throat> The Multiple Listing Service, or MLS, you'll hear it for short, the acronym, um, we use that a lot. And we talked about that a little bit in the first hour as well, but that, y'all, that's just a web-based program or website where agents that list houses for sale will load that onto the MLS so that buyer agents can look up or find properties for sale when they're representing their buyer, right? Um, now I will tell you, as if you're the listing agent, when you go when you put stuff in the MLS, um, you know, property for sale that you're listing, and we'll cover this a lot more detail when we get into the unit two course, but just so you know, y'all, you better not have anything in the MLS that's not accurate. Y'all, all information you provide about the property you're listing, you better verify it. And would I rely on what the seller tells me about the house or about the property? Not in totality, I would not. Yeah, I would verify all of it, okay? Um, Y'all, you put stuff in there. Y'all, for, just for example, and, and quite frankly, a very common issue um, in real estate. Y'all, say I list, the, I list the house and I put indicate there's 2,000 square feet. Y'all, you got to, that's just one piece of information you would have to put in there. So when that buyer makes the offer, y'all, they're making an offer on a 2,000 square foot home. Kind of makes sense. Well, can you see where there might be a problem if they find out later there was only 1,800 square feet? You misrepresented that property. So they wound up paying for 2,000 square feet and they only bought 1,800 square feet, right? That's 200 feet difference. Y'all, if it was priced at say $100 a foot, which is probably pretty cheap nowadays, but just for simpler math, y'all, what's that 200 square feet worth at $100 a foot? Y'all, that's $20,000, right? Um, y'all, could you imagine if you were the buyer and, and you find out later you paid an extra $20,000 for something that's not even there? Y'all, you got to verify information. That's on you. Y'all, you're not going to be able to always come back and say, well, but that's what the seller said. Okay, but the seller's not the one that put that information in the MLS. You are. Um, so you better make sure you verify it. And I will, and just real quick, I'll tell you another one that'll get you in trouble if, if, if it's wrong. Um, y'all schools, y'all, you'll put in the MLS, what schools is this property zoned for? <clears throat> y'all, and you, again, you mess around and put the wrong schools there. And mama bought that house thinking her baby was going to a particular school and then find out afterwards it's not zoned for that school. You're going to have a problem. So y'all, again, make sure you verify any information you put in that MLS because you know, you're going to be liable for it if it's not accurate. Okay, enough about the MLS. Now, we know this, this whole chapter is dealing with brokerage relationships. And you know, what you're looking at here, there are five relationships that are legal in South Carolina. You know, other states may not even recognize all of these. Some other states recognize different types of relationships, but these are the ones that are legal and recognized in South Carolina. Uh, five of them. In fact, we've already talked about them in the first hour a little bit. Seller agency means you're representing the seller. Obviously, that's legal. Buyer agency, representing the buyer, that's legal. 
dual agency, as long as all parties have agreed in writing and they're okay with it, that's legal. Remember, we also talked about an alternative to dual agency if somebody was not comfortable with it, was designated agency where there's two different sub-agents or licensees, uh, one working with the seller, one working with the buyer. That's legal. Again, has to be agreed upon in writing by all parties. And then the transactional broker. And if you remember, transaction brokers are working with who? Customers. Are, cut, or excuse me, are transaction brokers limited on how much they can do for a buyer or a seller? Absolutely they are. You know, as long as they decide to stay a customer, that means you're a transaction broker. And you cannot provide any professional services at all. You know, again, we're going to break this down some more. But those are the legal relationships that are allowed in South Carolina. Yeah, you know, I couldn't imagine they won't ask a question or two to make sure you know what types of relationships are legal in South Carolina. Yo, know, now could they put could one of your options in a question like that be a relationship that we didn't discuss here? Yes. Now if we didn't discuss it, what's the chances it's legal in South Carolina? None. <laughs> okay. So um, you know, I've had people come back and say, what well, they had sub-agency as a relationship, and we didn't talk about that. No, we did not, because it's not legal in South Carolina, and so we don't discuss, we don't get, we don't, we don't go over that. And there are other relationships. So you know, if, if you see something that's not familiar to you that we didn't discuss, chances are that's not going to be the right answer if they're asking you what's legal, right? Okay. Moving on. Just a few points about these types of relationships again. Um, first one we look at is the seller agency, meaning the seller has agreed to become your client. They have signed a written agency agreement or contract. So you're now representing the seller. Well, obviously in that case, you're gonna have to perform any services that you agree to in the listing agreement. Y'all, I would make sure you read these contracts. Um, cause I'm telling this is another area where agents get in trouble, where there are certain things that are just pre-printed in the contract that states you, the agent will do this, 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 and this. Now there should be, hopefully will be some other things that you wrote in there. I'm also going to do this, 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 and this. But a lot of times we don't read the contract and wind up not doing something that contract already specifically stated you would have to do and you didn't do it. Then that's a problem. Um, so obviously make sure you do everything that's in the contract. And if you're working for the seller, obviously in a seller agency agreement, then you know, you got to promote the best interest of the seller. All your advice, suggestions, opinions, you know, it better be in the seller's best interest. Now y'all, is it possible that you could recommend to a seller to do whatever because you believe it would be in their best interest, but it would not be in your best interest? Is that possible? Y'all, I'm going to tell you that's routine. Y'all, I'm telling you, if the seller ever determines or, or feels like that you've been advising them to do or not do things based on what's more so in your best interest instead of their best interest, going to be a problem. Not going to be a happy day. All right. Y'all, same thing if you have a buyer agency agreement. Obviously, now you're representing the buyer. Y'all, same thing there. Y'all, you got to make sure you perform everything you agreed to. To perform do the things you agreed to do this time everything you say do or recommend should be in the best interest of the buyer but if we get into that dual agency remember that means now you're representing both the buyer and the seller and is that legal it is in south carolina as long as you have that written consent Y'all meaning, y'all, you've got to explain to both parties what this means. 
You got to tell the buyer, buyer, I am representing you, but I'm also going to be representing the seller in this deal. So I owe just as much fiduciary duties to the seller as I do the buyer. You all you got to explain it to both sides that way. And then basically ask them, are you okay with that? Yup, if they are, then they sign the dual agency agreement and we move forward. But if either one of them says, no, I'm not comfortable with that, then dual agency is off the table. Y'all, you can't do that. So, y'all, again, if, if that happens, what's an alternative? Designated agency, um, <clears throat> which you see here. And then you have to explain to each party how this works. And basically, you tell them it's still dual agency because the company is still representing both parties, company being the broker in charge, right? That's the agent. But the reason this is a good, potentially a good idea for you, buyer or seller, is seller, I will represent you as the sub agent involved. But our broker in charge is going to designate a different licensee to work with the buyer. So this way, we're both receiving exclusive representation. It's just that both licensees just happen to be in the same office as the broker in charge. But it's still exclusive representation, right? Because they each have their own licensee representing them. You also, if they're okay with that, <clears throat> no problems. They there's a designated agency agreement. Y'all form, they'll sign it, and then we can move forward. Now, y'all, if they reject that, or either party rejects it, y'all, the only other option at this point, buyer, you're going to have to find, go to a, a different real estate company and find somebody else to represent you, because you're not you'll you'll continue representing the seller because you listed that property, y'all. So if the question is not which one, you know, if, if one says no, which one will I represent and which one will I not? You know, if you list the property, you will represent the seller. The only question is, can we also represent the buyer? And if somebody says no to dual and or designated, then buyer, you're going to have to go to a different company and get somebody else to work with you because we can't do it here. Okay. So that's what they're dealing with here. Um, again, the transactional broker, now remember, now if you're a transaction broker, who are you representing or working with? <coughs> Excuse me. A customer, right? Because you're, if they become a client, you're no longer a transaction broker. You're now the agent of the client. But until they become a client, you're a transaction broker, and that means that buyer or seller is a customer. We know we cannot provide professional services to a customer. That's a no-no. But you see here, y'all, here are some things that you can do for that buyer or seller as a transaction broker. Um, y'all, it says you must be fair and honest. Y'all, that sounds like a pretty good idea, regardless. Y'all, again, just because they're not your client does not mean you can lie, cheat, steal, mislead. Y'all, you still got to be a good person, right? Be fair and honest. You still have to account for funds if they come into your possession. Y'all, what they're talking about here is it's very common. Um, in fact, more common than not. When a buyer makes an offer, they will also put up some amount of earnest money. Y'all will talk more about what that is and why they do that later. But y'all, they might put up $1,000, for example. Y'all mean they'll write you a check as earnest money, and that goes along with the offer. Well, y'all, who's going to be holding on to that earnest money? You are, right? You have to account for these monies and these funds. Y'all, just because that person that wrote you the check is not a client does not mean you steal their money. That's all they're saying here. Y'all, again, makes sense. It also says you would have to use skill, care, and diligence in all transactions. Y'all, all they're saying, y'all, don't get involved, period, in a transaction that you are incompetent at doing. Y'all, you've never done it before. You don't know what you're doing. Um... 
y'all, then you need to stay out of it. But y'all, even if you agree to help them as a transaction broker, you still have to be competent, diligent in what you're doing throughout this transaction. It says you must disclose adverse material facts. You know, again, we got another chapter on mandated disclosures. We'll talk more detail about it then as well. But what we're saying here is, y'all, we have a law in South Carolina that requires anyone selling their home or property. If there's any defects, any material facts, y'all, that would be adverse, um, Problems with the property. Y'all, seller, you must disclose those things in writing to the buyer. You can't just tell them. It must, they have, the buyer better sign off acknowledging that you told them, my roof is leaking. Um, there's water puddling under the house. Y'all, these are defect, adverse material facts. The seller's required to disclose it. You know, is it possible you could list a house that through the conversation between you and the seller, they disclose to you some things that are wrong, but the seller decide, has decided, but I'm not telling the buyer. If we tell the buyer everything wrong with this house, we'll never sell it. So we're not going to tell them. No, no. We ain't, that's a no, no. Y'all, whether the seller discloses it or not, you have to, you know, if, if you have knowledge of a problem and you don't disclose it with the seller's consent or not, you're going to lose your license and some money over that. Um, so, you know, material facts, material defects must be disclosed, whether you're a transaction broker or the agent, either one says you must promptly deliver all offers and counter offers. That kind of makes sense. You know, for example, y'all say I'm watching the Super Bowl. It's on TV. Got all my friends over. We're having a Super Bowl party. And this buyer, which happens to be a customer because I'm a transaction broker, right? They never agreed to let me represent them, so I'm still just a transaction broker. But they contact me and said, all right, we've, we've written an offer on this house. We want you to go ahead and submit it. Well, can you just decide, okay, well, as um, soon as the game's over, I'll take care of it. No. No, that's not considered promptly. Promptly means you better get her done, like right now. Um, you, know, you cannot put this kind of stuff off. And I, I guess what... Some transaction brokers are thinking, well, if they were my client, yeah, I would jump on top of it and get it submitted. But they didn't want to be my client. They're, they're just a customer, so I will, I will submit it, but when it's convenient for me. Now, you're going to get yourself in trouble. If you're going to agree to work with somebody, even as a transaction broker, y'all, there are still some things you have to do. You, you, I mean, if you, if you don't want to work with them, then don't work with them. But once you agree to work with them, then you got to do things promptly. Okay? All right. It does say you owe some limited confidentiality. Y'all, we're going to talk more about confidentiality coming up here as well. But, y'all, obviously, if they're your client, you owe full confidentiality. Y'all, meaning, y'all, anything your client tells you in confidence and certainly if they tell you that, well, I'm going to tell you this, but I want this kept confidential. You know, you better, it better be kept confidential. You cannot repeat to anybody anything that's considered confidential in nature. Now, if they're not a client, they're just a customer, like we're referred to in this situation. You don't owe them full confidentiality. But, but it does indicate here you owe them some limited confidentiality. Um, you know, basically, what they're saying here is even though I don't owe you full confidentiality, at the same time, I can't go out there and start just saying things about this buyer that's going to hurt them when it comes to trying to buy the house or buy the property, right? Um, so you owe them some, there are some limited confidentiality requirements there. Again, we'll talk more about that as we go through. 
But then the last bullet you see there, it says we can only provide customer level services. Y'all, that means that's, that's the ministerial acts. Um, things that would be considered administrative in nature. Um, you certainly cannot provide any kind of professional services, <clears throat> cannot offer any advice, and you cannot offer your opinions. And I'm telling you, that's where we get in trouble. Because um, they're going to, I promise you, if you agree to help that buyer as a transactional broker, and of course they're a customer, they're going to ask you questions. They're going to want your opinion on things. I, I'm telling you, that's coming. And you're going to kind of feel obligated to help them because you know if they do the wrong thing, they're going to get themselves in trouble. We well, all, you're just going to have to let them get in trouble because you cannot provide any advice. You cannot provide any opinions. Y'all, your opinion, obviously your advice, is considered professional service. <coughs> Excuse me. Y'all, you can't do that. Um, y'all, and you're going to see why all this is important again as we move through. So you can only provide customer services or ministerial services. But then, y'all, here's a term... Um, that most agents probably will not ever be involved with, but they apparently like to ask about it from time to time on the exam. And it's, it's called agency coupled with an interest. You know, they, for some reason, they like to ask about it. Maybe in some states, this is a lot more common. <clears throat> I just don't see it much. M- myself, anyway, I don't see it much. But, um, but agency coupled with an interest says an agent has an agency relationship with the principal and a legal interest in the part in, in the property. Um, you know, in fact, you see an example I put here on the slide. In fact, let me just read what the example says and we'll just talk about it here a little bit. But it says the agent agrees to find a property for a builder to build to build on if the agent lists the property for sale when the house is built. Um, you know, what they're talking about is this, you know, let's say I've got someone, a builder looking to build a house, y'all spec home. They like to call them a lot of times, obviously to sell. Well, so I would go out and help them find some land, some property. They buy it. You know, obviously then I get paid a commission from, from that transaction. And that's typically what most, that's pretty much it with the agent but in this scenario they're saying uh what the builder's saying he's kind of adding something to it I, I need you to find me the property and obviously um i'll compensate you for finding the property but in addition to finding the property i will also once the house is built i'll let you list it for sale so if you'll find me the property, then I'll let you list it for sale once it's built, right? So that takes it a little bit further than just you find me the property, I'll pay you, know, you get paid your, co- your commission and then we're done. Nope, there's some, there's some more interest involved. So, um, so the agent will have more interest in tr- finding the property because they know that they're also going to get to list it once the house is built. For sale. Y'all, that's an agency coupled with an interest. There could be other examples, and there are. <clears throat> I think that's sufficient. <clears throat> y'all, the next thing you should see in your book, y'all, is talking about limiting your expertise. And I will tell you, this is another area you better be careful with. Um, it, y'all, let me just give you this example. Let's say you're working with a buyer. You take them into a house to, to, you know, a house they're interested in. So we go in just looking around. And we happen to notice maybe in one of the bedrooms that, you know, we looked up and noticed there's there's a wet spot in the ceiling. Ceiling's wet. Um, What's the chances the buyer will ask you? Well, why is that ceiling wet? Or is that ceiling wet? 
The ceiling looks wet. What do you think? Um, yeah, it looks wet to me. Uh, apparently, the roof might be leaking, or the roof is leaking. Yeah, and, and more than likely, that's probably the case. But yeah, I'm just telling you, if you tell that buyer that the roof is leaking, um, you better hope and pray that roof is leaking. Because if they find out later that is some other reason for that wet spot, y'all, you're going to have a problem. Y'all, I'm just telling you, y'all, and that's what they're kind of talking about. Y'all, limit your expertise. Y'all, you need to stay in your lane. Um, most of you, I would presume, would not be contractors, right? Um, now, if you are, you are, but most are not. So you don't know what's the cause of that wet spot in the ceiling. So the right answer uh, to your buyer would be, you know what, it, it appears like it might be wet and might even be able to feel it or whatever you're tall enough. But I have no idea why that's wet. We, if, if this is a house you think you may be interested in, obviously we're going to need to get a home inspector to come out here and, and let us know what's going on. Y'all let the home inspector do their part. You don't need to become the home inspector or the contractor. Um, you know, I don't care. And even if you are a contractor or have a lot of experience in this stuff, why do you want to create more liability for yourself? Stay in your lane. The lane you're in is as in, you're in the capacity of a real estate agent, you know, licensee. Y'all stay in that. Y'all, if they got questions about licensee type stuff, I'm all over it. But when it comes to the construction and looks like the foundation is cracked and looks like this is wrong and that's wrong, y'all, and it may be. Y'all, there's been many times I'm pretty sure I could see a problem and I know it's a problem. <coughs> but I'm not going there. Um, I'll point things out and say, hey, look, we probably need to get somebody to look at this. I don't know if it's a problem or not. But just, we'll just get somebody to look at it just to make sure that we're making good decisions here. So y'all limit your expertise. Y'all don't, don't try to be an expert at everything. Even if you feel like you know the answer. If it's outside your lane, don't answer it. <coughs> y'all apologize for the coughing. But y'all just another example, they might say, well, Frank, if I buy this house, will this affect my taxes in any way? Well, probably. Yeah, and, and there's some, th I know a fair amount about it just because I've been doing it a while, but am I an accountant? Nope. Am I an attorney? Nope. Am I going to try to answer that question? Nope. Um, I've said, well, buyer, that's an excellent question. Um, but you're probably going to need to address that with an accountant or your attorney or somebody like that. That's just really outside my lane, so I, I don't want to give you some bad information there. Um, I can help you if you don't have an accountant or whatever. I can, I can point you in that direction, but I can't answer that myself. Y'all, you got to be careful there. Okay. So, y'all, there are three types of liability you see here, and, and y'all, you need to be familiar with all three types. Understand them. <clears throat> the first type is the joint liability. Y'all, joint liability basically means, y'all, if something goes wrong, not only is the licensee liable for whatever went wrong, but so is the broker in charge, y'all, the agent. So in effect, the agent and the sub-agent are both liable. Y'all, that would make it jointly liable. Okay. Um, y'all, you could have several <clears throat> liability, several liability. Well, what does several mean? Y'all, this is a little bit contrary, I think, to what a lot of people might think. But several, at least in this context, means one. I know a lot of people say, well, several should mean sev lots, several people. No, several here means one. 
Several liability means there's only one party liable for the action, whatever action, well, either the agent or the sub-agent, um, but not both. That's what several liability means. And then the third one there is vicarious liability, and I know they like to ask about this one, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean they can't ask you about the other two at all. But, you know, if, you're, if you ever decide to become a broker in charge, you all the agent, you, by law, have vicarious liability. And basically what they're talking about here, y'all, is it possible that one of your licensees that's involved in a transaction could have information or knowledge about something that you never knew about as the broker in charge because it was never discussed with you? Guaranteed. I promise you that will be the case. Well, according to the law, and vicarious liability, that means if y'all broker in charge, if your licensee knew something, then you knew it. Whether you did or not is irrelevant. Under the law, you will be just as just as much trouble as your licensee. Because you will not be able to take the stand and say, but I did not know. Okay, well, your licensee knew it. By law, you knew it. Yo, and I guess where they're really going with this, if you didn't know it, then that kind of suggests the broker in charge wasn't doing a real good job of supervising here, right? Because that's what the broker in charge is required to do. Yo, they're supposed to be supervising, making sure everything's being done properly, done correctly. And for you to say you didn't know it, you're kind of saying I was not doing my job. I, I did not supervise very well. But anyway, so again, limit your expertise and be familiar with these three types of liability. You know, the next thing you see here, there are also three types of agents, okay? <clears throat> and this is something that you and your principal, again, will have to agree to. Uh, be part of the contract on, on what type of agent you're being hired to be. Um, so let's look at the three types of agents. Y'all, you could have a universal agent. Y'all, universal, y'all, it says here, has very broad authority when the acting on behalf of their principal. Y'all, I will tell you, uh, universal agents are not common in your traditional buying and selling of real estate. Y'all, this would be a very rare situation to have a universal agent. In fact, y'all, when it says broad authority, I mean, this is almost to, to an extreme. Um, for example, and I think I even used this example in your book, but y'all, let's say I'm hired by Walmart. Walmart, Walmart hires me as their agent with the instructions, um, Frankie, just go out into the world and locate the next perfect location for a Walmart Supercenter. Go find it anywhere in the world. Once you find what you believe is a perfect location, go ahead and buy it. And then we'll come out and build a new Walmart. Now y'all, doesn't that sound like an awful lot of authority? Yo, what's the chances you're going to have a typical buyer, somebody wanting to buy a house, telling you, look, here's what I want. I want three bedrooms, two bathrooms, two car garage, fireplace, uh, hardwood floors, 2,000 square feet. Go find it. And once you find it, buy it. And then we'll move in. No, that's not how that's going to work. But that is how universal agents work. You know, so when we say they have very broad authority, it is in fact very broad authority. But that's the universal agent. So who's the general agent? You know, it says that would be an agent of an agent. Well, who does that sound like? That would be you. Y'all, you know, that's the sub-agent. Y'all, you know, sub-agent is the agent of an agent um, or a licensee. 
So you're basically, you know, even, and this is something you, you really want to try to make sure you kind of understand for a lot of reasons here. Um, you know, let's say my brother wants to sell his house. So he calls me because he knows I got my real estate license. So he calls me to list the house. Well, am I the agent for my brother? No. My broker in charge is the agent. I will be the sub-agent. I'll be the one doing all the work, right? I'll be your first line point of contact. If you got problems or questions, call me. But technically and legally, the company or broker in charge, that's the agent. I'm just a sub-agent. Well, as the sub-agent, who am I representing? The company which is in turn, the company is representing my brother. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure you understand as a sub agent, you don't directly represent the principal. You represent the company and the company has been hired to represent the principal. All right. So you would be a general agent in that scenario. And then the third one here is the special agent. And y'all, the special agent, y'all, that's actually the agent or the broker in charge that's hired, y'all, the company, okay? So the broker in charge is the special agent. The sub-agent is a general agent. And then that universal agent, y'all, that's the one that's got that very broad authority, a lot of authority when they're acting on behalf of the principal. Now, y'all, here's something you want to be careful with. Y'all, a couple of things, because I know they're going to ask you at least a question. And the way they ask it can be tricky if you're not careful. Um, so I, I want to try to make you aware of what they're doing here. Y'all, first of all, going back to that universal agent. The people writing these questions, they know what I just told you about the broad authority. So a lot of times they will write a question that a agent that's listing a property has been granted broad authority to list and sell this residential home or whatever. They'll throw in that broad authority, y'all really to throw you off. Um, I wish they wouldn't do it, but they do. But here's what you need to, to kind of think about. Y'all, if it says in the question that this agent was granted broad authority to list the, a house for sale, well, does that sound like what a typical real estate agent would do? Yes, that's exactly what we do. Then that's not a universal agent. So don't, just because they put broad authority there, don't let that throw you off or trick you. Because you could just be lit, it could just be a traditional listing of a property with some degree of broad authority. It's just nowhere near what we were talking about earlier. Um, but y'all, if they indicate that the agent's doing stuff that does not seem common or typical, then you might consider that to be a universal agent. Okay. The second thing you want to be careful with here is a lot of times they'll say that a broker is listing a property for sale. What type of agent would that person be? And a lot of people will go with special agent because, it, well, it said it's a broker. Okay, but remember I said in the first hour, is there a difference between a broker and a broker in charge? Yes. Your broker is still a general agent, your sub agent. Broker in charge is the special agent. Y'all, I hope that makes sense. So you, you got to pay attention to what they're asking and pay attention to the vocabulary, okay? Um, anyway, I don't think you'll have a whole lot of trouble there. Y'all, if you're just paying attention, don't try to go too fast, and you'll be just fine.